again, everybody. It's David Thompson with Civil War Monitors Behind the Lines. I'm joined today by Dr. Marion Moser-Jones, who is an assistant professor of family science at the University of Maryland School of Public Health and the author of The American Red Cross, From Clara Barton to the New Deal, now out with Johns Hopkins University Press. So, Dr. Jones, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, David. Do you think you could just start by offering a bit of a broad overview of, of the book as a whole? Um, sure. So the book really looks at the um, American Red Cross, but also how Americans respond to disasters and emergencies and sort of the development of American humanitarianism um, and really starts with Clara Barton's Civil War work because Clara Barton was, of course, uh, the key founder in um, in the American Red Cross, um, and um, and then takes you all the way up through some of the major disasters like the Johnstown flood or the Mississippi flood of 1927 or um, uh, some other major disasters through to World War II or to the New Deal, really, and then you know ends with World War II. Um, so it really looks broadly at how do we, uh, when other people are in distress, how do we as a nation come together and respond, um, and how do we create organizations that respond to disasters, whether it's a mining disaster or, you know, a hurricane or an earthquake. Uh, I also cover the San Francisco, great San Francisco earthquake of 1906, um, and, um, you know, who gets a fair shake and who doesn't get a fair shake and, you know, um, the benevolence of ordinary people. And I wonder, it's, it's a very a unique topic, I guess. Um, people know about the Red Cross. They see the signs for blood drives all the time, I would imagine. I saw one even today walking <laughs> down uh, in the middle of campus. But I wonder what drew you to this topic originally? So, David, um, as you say, it's a really familiar topic. Um, the Red Cross is everywhere. Um, if there's a disaster, if there's a, you know, an emergency, we expect the Red Cross to show up. And um, the Red Cross is at once very familiar, and yet it's unfamiliar because we take it for granted. And so uh, my interest in the Red Cross as a sort of as a scholar and a writer began um, around 9-11 when I was down um, near the World Trade Center about five blocks away and like hundreds of thousands of other people, you know, fled the area and then saw the Red Cross come in as along with, you know, all these government agencies and police and military. And while the agencies, the res emergency responders, of course, and the military you expected, I thought, isn't this interesting? You know, this is this lead volunteer organization, and they're giving out socks to, to the rescue workers. And why is it that in the U.S., you know, when there's some major calamity, whether it's a terrorist attack or a, um, a natural disaster or when we go to war, that this organization in particular plays such a prominent role. And, um, and then I did a, a paper in graduate school, um, actually as well on World War One and how did the U.S. military triage shell shock. And, um, lo and behold, I found, you know, we had two million American troops in World War One, more or less. There were eight million women in the U.S., um, working, you know, on the, for the American Red Cross as volunteers and uh, about f almost 30 million men, women, and children volunteering uh, for the Red Cross. And so this was a major organization in the development uh, of the United States and U.S. history and the development of the U.S. As, as, I think, a humanitarian force in the world. I wonder, you, you did speak to the fact that this originated really uh, with a, a graduate paper, a uh, graduate seminar paper in the World War I era. How did it expand out to the, the present scope, uh, That the end result, I guess, being the book? Um, David, that's a really good question. So I got to the National Archives, and I was really privileged to, to be able to go there and look at the American Red Cross archives, and of course... I start with box one and I pull out the material and it's not, 
you know, sort of the memos, typewritten memos and reports and data sheets that I thought it would be. Um, I had looked at some material from the 20s and 30s that looked like that. It was handwritten letters by Clara Barton, some of which graphically describe her experiences in the Civil War when she was in the attack on Fort Wagner and, you know, the experience of having the blood of the Massachusetts 54th, you know, uh, on her hands and how she realized, well, these were men too. And, you know, just these very gripping and passionate descriptions of both war and disaster. Um, and so I realized I had to go back to the beginning. I had to find out about Clara Barton's experiences in the Civil War to understand where the Red Cross came from. Um, and then when I talk about, you know, going past World War One, of course, I wanted to sort of end at a point when the position of the Red Cross changed. And that really began to change during, you know, uh, the New Deal uh, when the government got a little more involved in disaster relief, but really with World War II, when uh, we had uh, in World War One and in the Spanish-American War, um, we ha we didn't really have much of a um, an army nurse corps or the medical aid wasn't that developed. But um, and, and as we know, in the Civil War, even with the Sanitary Commission, there were issues with that. World War II was when really the army and the military stepped up and took over that role. So there was a real shift there. And so that's that was a nice endpoint for this this particular book. But, yeah, I mean, I kept I could have kept going and written another 400 pages on the American Red Cross since World War II, and that is in the epilogue. I do have a full um, chronology of the American Red Cross. Um, but really, it's, you know, as I came to understand the importance of this organization, as I said, is a major uh, humanitarian uh, and benevolent organization in American history. I, it, the, the project just grew and grew. I wonder if we could... Back up again to, to Clara Barton, because she is sure. such a uh, fundamental figure when you're discussing the, the beginnings, the origins of the Red Cross here. What mm -hmm. was her Civil War experience like? Because I think you really aptly point out, she is a very remarkable woman, but a very unusual woman for her time. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it was unusual, first of all, for her to be living in Washington. She lived in a boarding house with her landlady, Elmira Fales, and, and, and Elmira's husband. She was unmarried. She was working as a patent clerk. These were just unheard of things to do then. And she was just, uh, you know, that was an unusual thing. She'd been a school teacher and really kind of a lark went to Washington and sort of happened into this. And similarly, she happened into the Civil War. It really uh, was happening all around her in, in northern Virginia and even literally with the soldiers, um, uh, the Union troops straggling into Washington over um, after um, the conflict in Baltimore in, in late April. And like other people in Washington, especially Washington women, she gathered her supplies and she went down to help these poorly supplied troops. Um, and then when there were battles there were, uh, in northern Virginia, um, you know, second bull run, she was able to take the train there and be at the side of the battle and, you know, uh, offer um, comfort to troops. But like other people, she, she really um, underestimated, I think, what that would be like at first. You know, people didn't realize that the Civil War would be as bloody or as total or as you know, uh, as go on as long as it did, of course. And so here she was, uh, um, you know, at Second Bull Run, and there were all these troops coming in wounded in horrible ways. And she stepped up, and she not only uh, offered them comfort and tried to stanch their wounds, but also, you know, would agree to write letters to their families if they were dying. Um, she offered them sort of psychological and emotional comfort. And I think for some people, this might have been too much. For many people, that might have been, okay, I've done my duty. But for Clara Barton, um, who had a tough time, I mean, she'd been a school teacher and then a patent clerk. She hadn't gotten married. She hadn't really, she was always sort of looking to establish herself, and she always felt like an outsider. I think she really found herself, 
her mission in life on that battlefield, that here she was, she could somehow handle it. She was healthy, uh, relatively healthy, she was relatively young, and for some reason she wasn't overly nauseated by the battle and she was able to really rise to the occasion. Um, and yet her battlefield experiences, when you read about them, are sort of somewhat ordinary. You know, she uh, I was just reading one letter where she was saying she was complaining of a sore finger and her sore finger wasn't too bad. But, you know, or, um, you know, meeting various low level um, officers and talking with them and not knowing what was going on, because, of course, nobody had, you know, a airplanes and ways to see troop movements in the same way that we do now. And so information was limited. Um, and so I think her experience was very ordinary in the sense that she was just an ordinary citizen who stepped up and did what she could and really didn't probably at the time realize the significance of it. She was just going from one situation to the next and trying to gather the supplies she could to help the people who she could help. And this service that she um, undertook did not end with the Civil War when we discuss, uh, but it didn't necessarily translate immediately into the Red Cross per se. Uh, no. she, she undertakes a lot of work uh, for now what are you union veterans as as the war is now over and i wonder if you could speak uh and tell our viewers just a little bit about what her immediate post war uh service was really like sure so um recently in fact or about a decade ago um a carpenter at, at, of the us government re, um actually rediscovered clara barton's office which is in downtown washington her missing soldiers office and it's kind of remarkable. She was really a humanitarian entrepreneur because, okay, most people after the war would just want to retire, take a break. But these families of soldiers who were missing were writing to her because she gained some renown as someone who was out there on the battlefields and might have information about the loved one of a, a particular Union soldier. And so she just got so many letters from families that she decided – okay, I'm going to try and do what I can. I'm going to go to Annapolis when they're arriving, you know, via boat from uh, being freed from Confederate um, prison camps and try to, to connect these skeletal traumatized men with their families. Um, and then she ran into, um, she found out about Andersonville Prison, of course, and uh, realized that, she, you know, she actually went down there with um, a veteran who'd been a prisoner at Andersonville and uh, who'd actually um, hidden a copy of the, um, the log of all the prisoners who were there in his clothing. And so um, she went down there and the generals were sort of like a little bit hesitant to allow her along, but they allowed her along. And um, by this time, she was sort of well-known. She got publicity. And she went around um, and marked the graves of a lot of the um, the dead at Andersonville or helped to do so along with uh, this party of uh, um, that, that went there and really um, also uh, secured publication of this list um, Horace Greeley's newspaper in New York published um, the list of, of the dead, and this brought closure to, to many families, to over 20,000 families um, who were wondering what had happened to their loved one. Um, so she, she did that work and then um, for, for about through 1866, and then she went on the lecture circuit tour and uh, became somewhat famous for her uh, tales about her Civil War um, experiences. And this lecture circuit is actually trying for her. She actually has, um, I believe, what you, what you term as a complete breakdown yes. um, as a result of it. And uh, following that, she heads off to Europe. And uh, I wonder if you could just share a little bit more what, what happens as, as she moves on her way to Europe. Right. So, right. So she gave this lecture, uh, these lectures, she traveled by train around the country and these were pretty, pretty rigorous train trips back then. And, um, and she lectured, you know, no microphones to veterans, to veteran audiences. And she was probably pretty exhausted from all of her missing soldiers work and her civil war work. And, uh, but she was a compelling speaker and she had these loyal veteran audiences who loved hearing about, um, 
her her Civil War tales, and I think part of it was because she really humanized this battle. It wasn't about troop movements backward and forward. It was about human suffering and comforting individual soldiers who may have been dying or may have been, uh, ha- you know, been given the courage to go on for one more day. Um, but uh, after uh, a couple of years of doing this, she literally broke down one during a lecture and lost her voice, suffered what she called a nervous collapse. And, um, you know, she just, I think it was probably physical exhaustion, maybe some depression, um, whatever it was, her doctor said, okay, you need to go recover in Switzerland. That was, you know, the rest cure uh, she was she was ordered to do. And by this time, she had enough money to do so. She'd been actually uh, awarded funds from the government um, because she put out so much of her own money for the missing soldier campaign and, and while she was working during the Civil War. Um, and she'd also earned money on the lecture tour, so she was able to go to, to Switzerland, and um, coincidentally, when she was there, she met the founders of the International Red Cross, um, Louis Appia, who was one of the founders, and she learned about this movement and said, wow, uh, we could use something like that in the United States, because uh, we weren't very well organized when we offered battlefield assistance to wounded soldiers. And that was the mission of the Red Cross back then. Um, and so she agreed to take this back to the United States. But um, she actually came back to the United States. Um, her sister passed away. She was then became exhausted and collapsed again. And it took her until about 1877 to really... Um, become healthy and energetic enough to um, mount what she would think of as a sort of a military style campaign, but um, to lobby um, uh, the U.S. government to accept the Geneva Conventions, which were the you know the, the 1864 Convention saying we're going to recognize you know the wounded of other countries um, and and care for them as we would care for our own, and also to start a Red Cross Society which would train to actually offer this volunteer medical aid to the wounded of any combatant, regardless of of national identity. And she did this with very little success, interestingly, uh, indirectly because of the Civil War. Because by 1877, 1878, uh, you know, Reconstruction, the post-Civil War Reconstruction was coming to an end, was at an end, and Americans were really weary of war. And the idea that we're going to have a national organization that just prepares volunteers to assist in wartime uh, was quite unappealing. You know, it was very unappealing to people. So she came up with this idea that, okay, not only would the Red Cross have wartime volunteers and nurses, but that it would also, during peacetime, have volunteer groups, trained volunteers, who'd be organized to rush to the scene of a disaster. And she saw the field of disaster much like the battlefield. Uh, She took the similar idea of going to the actual scene uh, where the disaster had occurred, and rather than just sending money or sending supplies and hoping the people there would get them, going herself and making sure that people got what they needed, and that when they didn't get what they needed, um, that she would uh, write her network of supporters and raise money and get publicity uh, so that people would get what they needed. Well, Dr. Jones, uh, it's quite a book. Again, it's The American Red Cross from Clara Barton to the New Deal out with Johns Hopkins Press. Uh, It would be fascinating, I think, for obviously anyone who's interested in the Civil War, but anybody who's interested in the history of medicine as well as just a a really strong institutional history of something, again, as we said, an organization that we're all very familiar with but yet very unfamiliar with at the same time. So, uh, Dr. Jones, thank you so much again for coming on with us, and uh, perhaps we'll have you on again in the future. Thank you so much, David.